thing for a very, very long time. Um, and today we're going to be going over basically the fundamentals of the affirmative side of the debate. So we'll talk about the prime minister constructive, the member of government constructive, and finally the prime minister rebuttal. All very good speeches. Uh, when I did competitive debate, I did the prime minister constructive. Well, actually, I did all three, but I primarily focused on the prime minister and the prime minister rebuttal. So I kind of have a, a unique perspective on those two speeches. The Prime Minister rebuttal, the very last speech in the debate, is my favorite speech. Um, a lot of pressure, a lot of decisions you have to make. Um, it's just a very exhilarating speech, similar to the NGC. So let me ask a few questions before we start with the basis um, for the Prime Minister construction uh, of the case itself. Um, so who here has learned a little bit of the fundamentals of Harley? Okay. Can I get a volunteer to tell me briefly some things that you have sort of learned or come in contact with? Anyone? Important stuff. Yeah, you got Importance of addressing stock issues. Okay, stock issues. Can you tell me about the stock issues? Uh, I think there would be a lot of different words for them. Sure. Um, some people say there's five, some people say there's four. Right. Uh, inherency, harms, solvency, that I forget. Inherency, harm, solvency, topicality, significance. Um, anyone else have no idea what the stock issues are? It's pretty important for this discussion uh, when we talk about the conceptual level of the Prime Minister or on a, the basis of debate in terms of the advocacy and the opposition. So before I get into the stock issues, there's two things you should know about both sides of the debate. The first is the burden. So each side has their own unique burdens. The affirmative has the burden of proof. So the AF has the burden of proof. And what this ultimately means is that they have the burden to demonstrate through evidence that the status quo should be changed. The status quo is just this uh, term that we refer to as just the, the state of being, what, what is happening in the world. So the affirmative must prove that there should be a substantive change. And the way that we aim that change is through the resolution. So typically, we'll, we'll interact with policy resolutions, which basically ask uh, the affirmative to make an action, to do something with the word in the resolution being should. On the flip side, the negative has the, the, the burden of rejoinder, but more importantly, presumption. Presumption is the idea that uh, what's going on in the status quo is fine, and that we don't need to change it. So there's this constant tension between the affirmative and the negative in terms of their understanding of the current state of affairs in the world or whatever unique topic you're talking about. So if we're talking about uh, things like increasing spending for sustainable energies, the affirmative would say we need to reorient our spending. Maybe we need to spend more. Maybe we need to take subsidies away from fossil fuels. The negative would say, eh, no, what's happening now is fine. They are subsidized, right? But there is also external risks to changing the steps. So that's the constant back and forth between the two. The app says status quo is bad, we need to change it. Neg typically says status quo is good, we don't need to change it. So that's sort of the overall conceptual understanding. Conceptual understanding of both sides of the debate, which gives us a good introduction into the prime minister constructive, because the prime minister's job in the opening speech is to demonstrate that proof, is to lay out the proof so we can get uh, into that. Does anyone have any questions about the burdens of each side, the presumption, or the burden of proof? It's pretty straightforward, right? Makes sense. It'll make a, a lot more clear sense once we give those a little bit more uh, substance. Okay. The, the last follow-up question, has anyone here ever constructed a PMC or seen a PMC being 
Okay, so a few folks. Um, can any one of you tell me like the important components of the PMC? Or just name a, a few of them? Yeah. Say definitions are pretty important. Definition? Well, why do you think definitions are important? Uh, because a single word in resolution can change the uh, the goal or <coughs> how you're accomplishing it. Right. The, the affirmative or the resolution. Yeah, precisely. So definitions are pretty important. Definitely. Kind of sets the stage and defines the context for what we're even talking about. Uh, did you have something else to add? Not really, no. For sure. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah. Um, like in your first contention, like getting out, like, um, like why the status quo needs to be changed, like talk about like how it is at right now, I guess. Right. right. So like a little background or inherency is another term for that. So inherency is, is synonymous with the status quo, but more specifically, what is preventing the status quo from making effective change is what inherency is. Anyone else want to add to that? So we have definitions, inherency, what's going on in the status quo is preventing the change. Those are two important pieces. Yeah, solvency. Solvency, one of the biggest uh, important parts of the affirmative. It is uh, the quintessential part, right? Because you're demonstrating your proof that the change will be effective, right? So solvency, definitions, Context, inherency, anything else you could think of. That's totally fine. That is the point of the lecture. I would just sort of get a baseline for where everyone is sort of at on that question. So with the PMC, there's three fundamental parts that you should be worried about that sort of make up the PMC. So the first is before the plan. Second, plan text. Third, everything after the plan text. So these are the three components. These are the three sections of the PMC itself. Each of them will have their own respective sections, but this is a good way to sort of couch it in terms of your priorities. So before the plan, we have things such as the inherency or the background. You could also have, and before the plan, things like definitions. and also framework. This is a little bit more advanced of a concept, but I really like talking about it in the beginning, because I feel like one of the common mistakes that new debaters make is not knowing how to resolve the debate. Right? It's just like, you say some stuff, they say some stuff, and then ultimately the judge makes a random decision. But the framework is important because it establishes the frame or the consensus of resolution. So how does the judge come to their conclusion for the debate round? Typically, judges will have their own personal preference. If you don't tell them how to evaluate the debate, some will default to just stock issues. Some will default to comparative impact analysis, which I'm pretty sure lecture, Tori Ship is doing a lecture on that a little bit later on today, so I won't go into depth about that. Um, but these are the three components of the beginning of the speech itself. Um, and eventually, after I go through each of these, then we'll go through an example of each of the components and, and how to uh, write on your PMC, especially for later on today. So the inherency, like I was saying before, just what's going on in the status quo, uh, uniquely uh, what's going on, and how the status quo is ineffective. What's your barrier to change? And the definitions, like we were saying before, you just pick and choose which definitions need clarity, right? Sometimes, though, I feel like a lot of redundancies happen here. Typically, definitions are contextually defined, and most of the time you won't need to define them specifically. If there is an issue with definitions, you will be let known about it in the LOC. The LOC will run a topicality argument against you if they think that there is a discrepancy in the definitions. So sometimes I think this is a waste of time. 
But nevertheless, I think it's an important component in terms of your knowledge in understanding debate starting out. So I would advocate for you to use definitions in the beginning so that everyone's on the same page. And sometimes it can give you a leg up for other negative arguments in the future. Um, but you'll come to a better understanding once you uh, become more seasoned debaters. But we'll go on to those specifically in a second. The next part, second part, is the plan text. Now the plan text arguably is the most important part of the PMC, right? Because it is your central source of offense. So offense is this idea uh, where you can basically solve for a unique impact, a unique harm, right? So you garner that offense from your unique verbiage of your plant text. So I would say plant text should be very specific. It shouldn't be vague. Uh, and it's, it's sort of this tightrope. Right? The rules of NPDA state that it should be sufficiently vague, so it shouldn't be this long passage that takes like two minutes to write down. But nevertheless, it shouldn't just be something like, the U.S. should pass Senate Bill 2, right? because we don't know what Senate Bill 2 is. It should be past the uh, objective of Senate Bill 2, so you would add more depth to it. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more specifically about plan text in a moment. And then lastly, after the plan text is things like solvency, and the advantages. So the advantages are basically your reasons why the plan text is a good idea. Compared to the status quo, they are your net benefits, the benefits of the status quo. So now that you know that there's three individual parts, we'll break each of these down individually into basically a, a format that you can use for prepping your PMC. And I will uh, say as a caveat that each institution has their own unique flavor of formatting for the PMC. I'm going to give you mine. Uh, it might differ from what your coaches will teach you. But nevertheless, it, it's good to sort of understand both directions. Because when you hear a PMC like this, it won't be startling, right? Because a lot of schools read PMCs differently. So just as a forewarning. So the first is the observation one. I typically am, am just shorthanded. I want resolutional analysis. <clears throat> resolutional analysis. The first argument is just a restating of the resolution. So this offers clarity for everyone who might not know exactly what the resolution is. It forces the PMC to write the resolution on top of, the, of their first page so that if there's any discrepancy with definitions or clarifications, you have it there always, right? So it, it establishes sort of the baseline, or even for the judge. Because sometimes judges who aren't coaching teams will just roll into a parley round and they don't know what the topic is. I know it's happened to me before. And it's always nice to be like, oh, this is the resolution. Get it down. Really sets the stage for the debate, right? Not making any assumptions. Second, you could put in your definitions. Right? That's all contextual to what the resolution would be. And then third, framework. Like I said before, framework's a little bit more of an advanced idea, right? Uh, but the way that you could frame the debate is through net benefits. And that is the idea of uh, coming down to the, uh, on the impact level of the harms level, which harms are worse? Does the affirmative avoid harms that are worse than the harms outlined by the negative? Does the affirmative uh, add benefits to the status quo, or do they add deficits to the status quo? This allows for an objective means for the judge to weigh whether or not the affirmative did a better job debating or the negative did a better job debating, right? So it, it, it adds a layer of resolution to the debate. Because sometimes as a judge, when I don't have this, I usually default to this. But it can be messy, right? It adds more variables to the debate than you wouldn't want originally. Because your, I, your whole point in the debate is to tell the judge how to vote, not to give them the decision to vote. You put the words in their mouth, and we'll get to that later on uh, in the PMR. So after this, 
Observation one resolutional analysis. You have the um, observation two, which is inherent. And this is basically the status quo. What's going on in the status quo and what's preventing your plan from happening? So maybe there is a law in place that's preventing your plan from passing. So maybe if we're talking about uh, amnesty for undocumented persons in the U.S., there is a law on the books right now criminalizing that act, so maybe we would repeal that law. Maybe we would pass another law that would dwarf that law, right? So there's a structural barrier preventing us from resolving sort of the issues in this status quo. So this is defined as the pre-plan part of your app. So this are, these are the components that happen before the plan. After that, you have the plan text. <coughs> and typically, the plan text should be sort of in between specific and vague. It shouldn't be too vague to where the negative is confused. But it shouldn't be too specific to where the negative arguments don't have any clout or any ground to them, right? So, for instance, like if we're saying the, the United States should, like the LD topic, it's like the United States should substantially increase uh, funding for sustainable energies. If you would say um, the USFG should increase, USFG should I'm going to abbreviate a little, increase uh, funding for sustainable energy, energies, by uh, increasing, so by uh, increasing subsidies by X amount, or uh, putting in uh, certain standards, right? So maybe offering, uh, I don't know, $1 million in subsidies. To solar. Right? So if your resolution is the U.S. should increase funding for sustainable energies, you would the plan text that you potentially could have would basically be USFG should increase funding for sustainable energies by uh, $1 million in, uh, by giving $1 million uh, in subsidies to solar. Right? It's pretty simple. But it gets to the very crux of how you're trying to solve a unique problem. And with all honesty, we could do an entire lab sec section or session on writing plan texts. Uh, but I feel like plan text, by and large, um, your coaches should help you in the prep, but also it just comes with experience and knowledge and how to write them as concise as possible. So before plan text, after the plan text. After the plan text, uh, you would have observation three, solvency. And this is the independent solvency sheet. So some typical arguments you would read here uh, include the actor can do this. Actor can do this or they're the only ones to do this. So actor being uh, the organization or the, uh, the person in the plan text who enacts the policy. In this case, it would be the United States federal government, could be the United Nations, could be the European Union, uh, it, it could be a number of actors, right? But the first solvency argument typically demonstrates just the functionality of the plan text. So the actor can pass this because they pass federal legislation, they get to divvy out subsidies, right? So it gives them justification to do so. Second would be uh, outlining sort of maybe uh, it would be an economy-based question. So maybe it would be economically feasible, or maybe it would isolate 
uh, a unique problem happening in the status quo. Um, so, or problem or harm. Harm and resolution. <clears throat> so maybe we talk about how fossil fuels are, are harming the environment and this comes to a resolution because it shifts subsidies away from fossil fuels, right? And then the last piece here would be the implication. So maybe this sets a precedent for the future. Um, it, it means that there is more subsidies to come. There's something like this, right? But these aren't always going to be the same arguments. These are just some baseline ones that you can use a lot. But typically, this part of the debate, uh, it's sort of, it could potentially be optional, right? In other contexts, you could uh, prep for arguments you anticipate the negative to read. So in this regard, you would probably hear an uh, economy-based argument. So uh, here, maybe if you talk about the economic viability of some, that would be smart for your MG. We'll talk about that later in that speech. Uh, but there's a, there's a few things that you can play around with solvency, and that's the cool part about it. Everyone get this. Is there any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, can you just go a little bit more into implication as it differs from impacts? It is the effects. Oh, okay. But I'm just using a different word, okay. right? So it'd just be a demonstration or application of a unique impact from fossil fuels. Maybe climate change, uh, maybe a, a more short-term impact of uh, the economy or something like that. <clears throat> And then next, we have the advantages. So add one. <clears throat> and typically, you would have two advantages. Um, and this is another mistake that I see new debaters making. It, it's just purely a question of preparation time and getting used to the crunch and writing quickly and using shorthand. Because debate it, it is a game of speed. Right? It, it's a game of being able to come up with these arguments as fast as you can and be able to uh, put them down in an organized fashion, right? both in preparation time when you're writing it and both in round when you're hearing it being said and you're responding to arguments. right? So having two advantages gives you a unique edge in the debate. Um, the reason for this is because it diversifies your argumentation. So if you just go in with one singular advantage, the negative team has one argument to beat. If they beat this, you lose, right? If you have two, they have two different ones, which means the PMR has options for how they want the judge to evaluate the debate. Um, so I would say that um, PMCs, PMCs should primarily focus on getting two advantages out, uh, and there's some strategies that you could go about doing that. The advantage is uh, written like this. I'll go through these as well. So you have uniqueness, the link, internal link, and impact. Those are the typical structures that you'll see within your advantages. So uniqueness is a new term. Uh, has anyone encountered this term before? A few folks? So uniqueness is basically dis a description, a more precise description of the status quo. So come, going along the same lines of the uh, energies debate, so maybe we're increasing subsidies for you know, sustainable energies and we're trying to um, adjust to climate change. So it would be climate change uh, adaptation. That's, a, that's another distinction that's pretty important. At this point, we can't universally solve climate change. So further advantages means that we adapt to it. Right? We try to, as much as possible to alleviate the side effects of it because we are 
vastly approaching the point of no return, but that's a, a whole other discussion. So if we're going along with this idea, this, this uniqueness argument would describe uh, how climate change, I'm just going to abbreviate it with CC to, for time's sake, climate change uh, is happening now. Two, climate change will continue. And three is sometimes uh, a more long-term based argument, but uh, more often than not, it's like a, a, a justification or a now is key based argument. So the function of the uniqueness is to paint the picture of the future and of what's now. It's a description, right? So the first argument is a description of what's happening in the status quo. Right now, we're seeing the effects of climate change, right? Look at Dory, right? And how uh, it literally just like kind of set on top of the Bahamas for so long. That is a byproduct of climate change, right? Second, and also, we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change releasing studies about how uh, two degrees uh, increase Celsius will cause irrevocable impacts uh, to the globe. Second, climate change will continue. We don't see any substantive shifts in energy policies for any of the developed nations, primarily the U.S., you know, China, Russia, India. None of them are changing their policies, which means that climate change is continuing to happen. And third, now it's key, we are starting to see the devastating impacts, rising tides, um, we're going to see the impacts of environmental refugees, we're already seeing that now in the Bahamas, right? They, they're, the island was completely wiped out, right? So it's just a description, what's happening now, what's going to happen, and why we need to do something about it. The next step is what you do about it. You demonstrate your solvency. So we increase uh, funding in sustainable energies. We try to move away from fossil fuels, right? And that is one of the key ways uh, to combat and adapt to climate change, is to sort of slow it down, and hopefully uh, we get to that sort of breaking point. So this is just a question of how you solve for this stuff happening. The internal link and the impacts are the steps that it takes to get to something really, really bad, right? So the internal links uh, would say something like, uh, without funding sustainable energies and continuing to fund fossil fuels, we'll continue to see these impacts happen. And in the distant future, we'll see them come to head. We will see the ocean levels rise to where uh, countries like Bangladesh no longer exist because they were underwater, right? Uh, we will see the temperature rise to this, is such extent that people die in a vast quantity and vast amounts like we're seeing in South Asia uh, currently during the summers. Like the asphalt is literally melting, right? It is getting that hot. So you would detail the steps it would take to reach the, the apex negative, negative impact, right? So, you know, climate change happening, we're seeing the devastating results, and then finally, uh, uh, the culmination of that. And there are two types of impacts here. You got the negative impacts and the positive impacts. <clears throat> negative impacts result in death, right? People are going to die. It is the negative, right? Positive impacts say that we do something good, right? So the positive impacts of this would be that we are shifting away from fossil fuels, which means that we can uh, rebuild sustainable uh, energy sort of sectors, right? And sort of rebuild things. And, 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 and that's better for things like the economy, because it sort of shifts into uh, our contemporary times. Um, it's, good for, it's good for people and the economy, right? So death, death of people, good for people. Right? And it's good to diversify those, because uh, what we'll see is that both of these arguments hold uh, their unique position in the debate. This uniquely uh, functions as a good piece of argumentation for the MG. Um, when they're going through and answering the negations arguments. So that is the advantages. So the advantage one and advantage two don't differ very much. I'm not really going to get into the nuances of how you sort of describe the two. Um, just briefly, I suppose, the, the advantage one we call, or at least when I was debating, is called the intrinsic advantage. It is the direct result of the plan text and how we can resolve directly. Advantage two is a little bit more extrinsic. So you might say advantage two in this context is U.S. energy leadership. 
So the country will also follow suit behind us if we start making these radical changes, right? Because there is precedence for other countries following what the United States does, right? We are a global leader in a lot of different things. We're kind of losing our standing, but that, that's debatable. It's always debatable, right? So the advantage to would speak a little bit more of that. It's more of a perception-based argument rather than a direct result of funding increasing and then abating or, you know, the, the impacts. Anyone have any questions about the advantage? Yeah. Well, my question is more of, so when you get to, like, your first advantage and then your second advantage, um, wouldn't you talk about, like, the net benefits of your plan then? Or, like, I guess I'm just, like, confused then about the framework and the observation one. So this is the net benefit. Okay. Your net benefit to the status quo is people not dying and then adding something substantive to it to help people in the future. Does that make sense to everyone? <clears throat> so like the net benefit being that uh, if we didn't take this step in the status quo, then it, you wouldn't see uh, you know, the positive results. And also, that's, also that's, uh, that's a great question. And that's also fun the function of the uniqueness. So a common term you'll hear is that uniqueness controls the direction of the link. What that ultimately means is that if we win on the affirmative that climate change is happening and the status quo is not doing enough to stop it, it means that our story of death happens, right? It's going to happen. Unless the negative comes up here and says, climate change is being combated by X, Y, and Z. They're taking steps. We don't need the plan. Then it would shift to say that climate change is being combated now. We don't need the plan, which means that the impacts are negated. They're sort of um, checked for. There's something happening that is resolving them already, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Any other questions? I know you have. Shoot them, shoot them up here. What do what you not understand thus far? Yes? Because of uh, the way that I was taught, I didn't really, I was never given like an opposition to be the solvency one. Sure. Can you explain the difference between the problem, the harm to resolution and like the implication? The harm to resolution? Uh, I would say uh, some of the times they're it's two steps, so you would isolate sort of the, the harm itself mm -hmm. and then in detail how you would solve it, right? Vice versa. It's sort of interchangeable. Um, there's not a huge substantive difference between the two. Um, like that second argument, think of it somewhat as a uniqueness argument. So it's like harm's happening now, here's how we resolve it, here's the implication to that harm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm curious how it's different from you mentioning like the uniqueness is and the advantage and then saying it we're solving it with a plan. Like what's the difference between the two? The, the difference primarily being that it would be a different impact. Okay. So it gives you more leverage. Um, so if all else fails, if you lose advantage one and you lose advantage two, you have that. Does that make sense? Can you give an example like given the resolution you've been using with the climate change? Right, so uh, I suppose we could talk in solid seat about uh, environmental refugees or something like this, right? Uh, it's something a little bit more shorter term than uh, earth-wide destruction and uninhabitability, right? Which is where you would talk about here, mm -hmm. like the, the future. So I guess it would be, uh, in some cases, a discrepancy in time frame, right? This, more often than not, is going to be a very long term time frame, like you hear like the common like thing about debate is like it always ends in nuclear war, right? Because we take it to the nth degree, right? What is the worst case scenario, right? And that's where we detail it in a negative impact. Something that you could detail as a short term impact in the solvency would be something like the, the movement of people away from their devastated countries. Does that make sense? Yeah, can you do like a little run through like of each part of that with that example? Sure. I can do that. Does anyone need this still? I'll, I'll write it over here, just in case. And like I said, there's differentials in, in how schools ultimately do this. And you don't have to do this. Uh, but nevertheless, it's good to know that you can have it in your, in your bag of tricks if you ever need to pull it out. So going along with the resolution about Funding sustainable energies. 
So the first is that the U.S. is key. The U.S. is key for a few reasons. First, it is it, they pass a law becomes federal policy. All the states have to abide by it. States can't, like, California is one of the leaders of climate-based sort of research, climate technologies, right? But it doesn't matter if, if, if California is doing all this stuff if, like, half of the entire United States does not, right? Trump is literally rolling back all of Obama-based climate change policies, like the Clean Power Plan, the vehicle emission standards, all of these things. So universality is key, because right now, uh, the Newsom administration is about to uh, have a lawsuit over uh, Trump, like, forcing California to reduce our um, car emission standards and stuff like that. So the U.S. is key in that regard. And the reason why you have this argument here is in case they run a 50 states counterplan, which says instead of the federal government doing this, all 50 states should uh, do that. But there are different arguments to that. So universally, the U.S. is key for that reason. And second, uh, because they're the ones that control like the purse. They control all these, these monies, right, substantively speaking. Second, you could talk about how uh, right now um, we are seeing the impact of um, environmental refugees are basically been here, but they're just going to continue to increase. So, I mean, if you look to the Bahamas, uh, even probably still in Puerto Rico to a certain extent, right? Hurricane uh, Maria devastated that population. They still don't have access to clean water, to food, to electricity. And we're seeing that devastation right now in the Bahamas. So you would detail, right now, we are seeing the short-term impacts because we have environmental refugees. Like, it doesn't matter, like, unless we literally roll in and rebuild all of society, like, in one swoop for them, like, they're either going to have to, like, continue fending for themselves, right? There's a lot of issues going on in that regard. Third would be one of the byproducts of uh, adapting to climate change uh, would be that we would uh, alleviate some of the stresses of environmental refugees. So we would uh, try to alleviate some of the harms. Um, so we would solve uh, some of the impacts. That's how I read the impacts, right? So it gives you something else, uh, another story, another narrative for you to use. But this is just one genre of solvency arguments that you can use. Other arguments include, uh, instead of saying environmental refugees here, and then talking about solving those impacts and that devastation, you could say, like, solar, uh, is uh, a good investment. And that's to say, like, they may run an argument against you that says, like, the fossil fuel industry is a pretty big part of the U.S. economy. If you take their subsidies away, it's going to cause effects globally, economically speaking. So in order to combat that, in here, you would just say, it's a good investment, and overall, we can... Um, stave off some of these economic impacts, right? Again, it helps your MG in the future speech. And then lastly, you could have another preemptive argument about how it's bipartisan. I'll abbreviate that. So, uh, what you would see here is three unique arguments that are positioned to be rebuttals to negative arguments. Does that make sense? So I would say that this is my favorite use of solvency, and that's what I always would do. Um, the other one, uh, the other form was uh, what my coach would, would encourage us to do, but this helps you with counter plans, 50 states counter plan. This helps you with economy-based disadvantages. This helps you with politics-based disadvantages. So these are three key arguments that the MG can just get up in their next speech and say, extend solvency to, to the economy disadvantage. Solar is good for the economy, X, Y, and Z. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. I just had a question, like, maybe I'm missing something, but how would you run the bipartisan case? Because the way I understand it, it's like the negs just could come back with, oh, Republicans think Democrats are alarmists, and Democrats think Republicans are climate change deniers. So, like, how would you frame that argument when you're actually in the round, do you think? I would say that uh, one of the key parts is the research behind whatever proposition or whatever plan text you have. So if you, like, have 
a plan text to which you can go and find unique pieces of legislation or at least some. Uh, well, the, the short answer is I would go to the Senate, I would find Republicans who would support this, and I would stack them up. I would find Democrats, I would find independents. On the flip side, I would go to the House of Representatives, I would find Republicans and, and, uh, and Democrats and independents who support this, and my answer would be, sure, that's the brand narrative, but on the ground, there are people working together to get this passed, because not all Republicans think of climate change as a hoax, right? So you would have the upper hand in terms of the warrants versus a, a vague argument like that. Okay. So you would go for names of people. But that's very extensive so instead research. of saying just like Republicans say, like Rand Paul or something like that. Yeah, you would go find independent names and independent quotations potentially. Yeah. Okay. But like, wouldn't you not even really need to get like that in depth into it if it, they didn't even have like good sources that backed that? Oh, Republicans think like isn't that too vague in general? It like, is, but if you just say it's bipart, that's not an argument either. That's a claim. That's a start of an argument. So you would need some specificity too. But yes, that would be a bad argument, and something like this would. You know, keep it off. Um, but I'm not like telling you that you have to do this at every step of the way. Sometimes, eventually in your careers, you'll you'll get to know other teams from other schools. You know what they run, right? Some teams are purely critique teams. Some teams purely run politics and, and economy-based arguments. So that's when you'll be like, oh, this team is known for running politics that are sometimes really annoying. So let's put some preemptive arguments in just to counter it from the gate, right? to give our MGs some extra time to think because they know they have arguments embedded within the affirmative that they can use in the future speeches. And we'll get to that on the MG. Does that make sense? But also, uh, with all honesty, in some cases that you could just sort of not have this. And if you wanted to put these styles of arguments in here, you could put different flavors of these arguments in your links if you wanted to, right? Just to clear up any confusion you may have. Any other questions? PMC is a very daunting task, but I would say the best practice is to come up with your own format, come up with your own way to sketch the, the, the skeleton of it, and once you have your skeleton, you just sort of input right, into uh, each of them. right? So your resolutional analysis, your advantage, you sketch up A, B, C, D, and then you write arguments under there. Right? Once you kind of break it apart, it becomes a little bit easier. Because eventually what you'll find is that internal links, like at the beginning of the season, if you write genres of impact, so you'll have internal links and impacts. So if you write a climate change based impact, it's not really going to change much. right? You have all your good evidence there. So in the future, You'll be like, oh, I already have these arguments prepped. The only thing I have to worry about is uniqueness and links. Right? That's where sort of I was in my debate career. And then once you get even further up, right, if some of you transfer to four years or something like that and go on to base scholarships, uh, I was required to memorize my internal links and impacts. So I didn't even write them in prep time. I would just say them because I knew them, because I read them so much. Right? And similar with some of this other stuff. So debate's a game of knowledge, folks. The more that you know, than your opponent, the more likely that you are going to win. If you don't know as much as your opponent, the more likely you're going to lose, unless you're like a master framer or uh, you have some other qualities. But debate is, is a game of knowledge, fundamentally. And I would say that memorizing arguments and knowing arguments and having them in my back pocket saved me more time than not. Especially on the negative side of debate, but we're not going to really talk about the negative today. Any last questions about the PMC? So I would say for today, uh, when you're prepping your PMCs, don't, don't stress out if, if you don't have two advantages. Don't stress out if you don't have all of these components. Right? As long as you have a plan text and a advantage and advantage, then you can win the debate. Right. That, you, that you can function with that. You can use that, right? But nevertheless, you can strive for you know wherever you want to be. But uh, that's kind of my perception of it. Questions? Yeah. If I wanted just to sit down one day and try to memorize as many um, arguments as I could, like what would be a good resource for that? A good resource. That's a good question. Um, the unfortunate thing about parliamentary debate is that there's not a lot of open source uh, like files that you can go see. Um, what I would say to do is to start from like understanding like 
things like climate change, foreign policy, wars, how wars start, um, and then sketch out your own to a degree. So when you're writing it, you're building that knowledge, and then I would do speaker drills on those. That's what I did, right? So like I would have like resource wars uh, impact, which is like uh, eventually when uh, the earth can't supply enough food for everyone. We have a war over land because there's only so much land in the world that can produce food. So that would lead to a conflict, right? So that's one impact. You can talk about water. Um, climate change has ocean acidification, sea level rise, uh, extreme weather events, environmental refugees, uh, and, a, and a few other flavors of the impact. I would just say write like a whole file of it and then just know it inside and out because it will save you so much time in prep if you don't have to do that yourself. I'm right here. Yeah, of course. All right, if there's no other questions, then I will shift into the MG. So the member of government speech is one that people will tell you is the hardest. Uh, because people will often say that the MG is a speech of I gotcha. So if the MG doesn't understand what the leader of opposition, the first negative speaker, says, then they won't be able to answer the argument sufficiently enough, right? And whatever your MG says, Arguments that you have to extend and go off of in your PMR, right? So your MG is a critical glue between uh, your, your PMR and uh, your, your PMC itself. So the, the MG, there, there's a few things that you should focus on in the MG, and those start even outside of debate tournaments, uh, into the preparation time, and during the round itself. There are some strategies that you can sort of cope with. Uh, the stress and just sort of understanding and knowing uh, beforehand what you what you need to do. So the first is pre-tournament. So we like to think that parley is something you just like kind of roll in and do. And like by and large, like y'all, if you if you, I mean, I don't think many of y'all, if any, are on scholarships. You don't have obligations to meet. You're just here to learn this activity to get better at advocating for yourself, for others, and just understanding the world, right? And, and just becoming better arguers, ultimately. But if you want to get really good at the MG, it starts at the news cycle before the tournament. And what I mean by the news cycle is what's ever happening, right? Listen to NPR every day. Read economic indicators, consumer confidence, business confidence, investor confidence, uh, agro-business confidence, right? All of these things. Read what's happening in the European Union with Brexit. Uh, what is uh, the opposition in the British Parliament saying uh, about, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head Boris now. Johnson. Yeah, Boris Johnson, right? How's that going? Because you might have a resolution uh, that says that the UK Parliament should do X. So you should know about those things, right? But a few of the sort of arguments that you should know a decent amount, at least domestically, is the econ and the politics. I don't think that y'all will see too many politics disadvantages, but I guarantee you'll see a few economy-based disadvantages uh, against you. Um, and what I mean about the economy is just understanding it a little bit, right? Being able to kind of explain it. If you're an economy major or finance major, you have a unique leg up in this department. If not, then you're going to have to do some reading to simplify it. Because there's nothing worse in the debate than seeing two sides of a debate not knowing what they are debating about, right? And then sort of just having these nonsensical arguments. So knowing a little about the economy will be pretty critical overall, I would say. And then just sort of general news. The NG has to be uniquely knowledgeable uh, about all of these things because they are the ones uniquely answering those arguments throughout the course uh, of the debate. And if you don't have these sort of solid responses, then it becomes hard, right? Uh, and it, it becomes a, a huge challenge moving into the PMR if you don't have a solid basis for your arguments. So the MG starts outside of the tournament by just knowing a lot. Furthermore, uh, during the preparation time, uh, like your 30, 20 minutes or so before the round starts, uh, the MG should focus on uh, 
understanding the affirmative overall, right? Like, what is the PMC saying? What is the overall argument of the PMC? Uh, so you can conceptually understand it, right, when you're answering arguments. And then during the round itself, uh, the MG uh, should be doing a few things. So during the round. So during the round, uh, the MG should have a very, very clear flow of the PMC. They should have all the arguments as much as they possibly can, because the, uh, the PMC is, is your best argument, right? It is the first speech. Uh, it is a speech that you get to sort of pr present, um, not argued yet, right? Uh, so the MG should have a good flow of the PMC speech. After that, uh, the MG should pick a couple of two strategies. The first being flowing everything that the LOC, the first negative speaker says, almost verbatim as, as much as they can. Right? The second strategy is to get the general idea of what they're flowing. Right? And that becomes a little bit more advanced in the future. Because uh, well, something that the MG will have to do is they'll have to flow arguments and flow answers to arguments simultaneously. So you're kind of going back, forth, back, forth. So they say this, okay, what's an answer to that? Write that. They say this, write an answer to that, right? That is the ideal version of the MG speech. But sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes in the beginning, especially, what you'll find yourself doing is flowing their arguments and then have to answer them sort of on the fly, right? As you go, as you roll um, through it. So I would say that the MG uniquely is it's a game of shorthand. So you should have a very, very, very clear shorthand throughout the MG speech because you don't want to write everything completely uh, verbatim down. So you want to flow the PMC almost perfect. You want to focus on the larger picture overall in the debate. So if they read that economy argument, so like what are they saying? What, what, what about the economy is bad? Okay, is it the investors? Is it the businesses? Or is it the people? Is it the consumer? Right. Once you figure out those questions, then you can start catering your arguments a little bit more specifically. Uh, to uh, the, ne the negation. And then the, the sort of the next slide is uh, you have to understand that once the MG is over, uh, your job in the debate is not over, right? So uh, this is another thing I see young debaters do a lot is that they'll flow up to the MG, they'll give their MG and then they'll stop. They'll just stop flowing and then they'll just like kind of flow and just sit there, right? But you should be flowing vigorously for the rest of the debate because it is your job to check to make sure that the LOR doesn't make new arguments. So the rebuttal of speeches, you can't make new arguments. You can have new examples, you can extend arguments that were previously made, but you can't make new ones. So an MG not paying attention just lets the negative say whatever they want. That is a, ultimately a bad strategy, right? So you have to pay attention. That's why you got to keep a tight knit flow, right? You got to keep tight uh, sort of notes. Yeah. If they do make new arguments, you just what do you do? This is a good question. So the procedure, a uh, parliamentary procedure, what you would do in that instant, if you hear that new argument, you would say, point of order. The judge will stop the round, it will stop the, they will stop the timer, and it is your job to isolate. The new argument is X. Very specifically. Don't make, because sometimes people will make their own arguments within that, but you shouldn't. You should just isolate. I believe this argument is new, should have had a chance to respond to it in the MG. Right? And that will happen in, in the LOR. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, so a beginner, what do you mean by point of order and how long would it take? Right, so the uh, point of order is the mechanism in which you get to check the other team. Right. It's like a check and balance system. So if you hear or flow an argument that they have not previously made, right, you're able to isolate it. Um, it, it sometimes it can take, you know, one minute, sometimes it can take a couple. It doesn't take very long, but you would raise your hand in the debate and say point of order. The judge would stop the time. Everyone would be like, okay, what's the new argument? You would tell what the new argument is. And then after that, the judge would say, point not well taken. Or um, they would say, under consideration. So point not well taken, point well taken, or under consideration. So point well taken means the judge agrees. It's a new argument. You should not make it. They crossed it out on their flow, and they're not evaluating it. Point not well taken means it's a bad point of order, and the other team made the argument. And it was a silly thing to do. Under consideration means the judge 
flagged it, they circled it, and they may evaluate it later in the debate and figure out whether or not for themselves they believe it is new. Does that make sense? So it's just a mechanism to ensure the rebuttalists sort of stay true to uh, not making new arguments. Because it's unfair. Because the affirmative doesn't have a chance to respond. We, okay. All right, folks. Uh, we have ran out of time. But I think that the majority of the stuff that we've been talking about for the MG applies just the same to the PMR. Just answering things, right? So keeping a tight flow of everything, making sure you understand your first speech in the PMC and your MG speech, right? And then similar to the points of order with the MG, um, the other side will also, like when you talk about the negative, the other side also has that for you. You'll talk about that later. And if you have any questions during the point of the camp, just come let me know.